Let's just begin by announcing our theme once again, the kingdom, then you in 2022. And if you remember right, we were taking a look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, is our theme verse, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he, he will add, it's amazing, he will give you everything you need. Now that's a big time promise. It's a, almost a boast in the Lord, but there's that premise to the promise. And the premise is, let's go for the kingdom first. What does that look like? Remember, we started off saying, hey, let's read our Bibles through this annual Bible reader. You who are online, please go to our website. If you're not on there, go to media, scroll down to resources. This same reader is right there. If you've been with us, yesterday's readings, Genesis 43, 44, so exciting. Many of you are saying, I didn't know that was in the Bible. Did you know this story, Pastor Paul? And it's, it's like, yeah, I'm glad you're checking it out. But here we have, really, Joseph is now second in charge of all of Egypt. It's a great story. And then he has complete control of the little jugulars of his brothers who are jealous and put him in jail. And so what does he do? You got to read it. It's just too good to be true. You can't make this stuff up. Anyway, what an amazing young man Joseph is. Nothing negative said about him. But let's read that. Let's spend time in the word so important for us. And remember the kingdom, eight words, that is really God's reign through God's people over God's place. So it's important that we consider those areas. God's bringing that on down. Today's message, it's part four. We're four weeks into this year, four weeks into it. And today's message is titled, The Kingdom and Your Authority in Christ. It's a big time element that we're going to discover and enjoy. And I hope you can eliminate at home or at the workplace any distractions because this seriously because you are in Christ and are a believer, there's much more for those around you that need to benefit because of who you are in Jesus. And that's called authority. It's important. So it's important that we get a chance to hear. I want to highlight, too, if you can, let's make sure that we start to take notes. How many know it's life group season? So we want to take our bulletin, scan that QR code. Let's make some notes. You never know what you see here. And reading, it's like, what? What was that? Saw a cute little thing in a bulletin. It literally said, they were highlighting a midweek service, and it said, don't let worry kill you. Let the church help. <laughs> it's all how you phrase it. So I'm going to pray now because what I say, you might take it a whole other direction. That may not be helpful. We want your time to be beneficial, not just now, but for time and eternity. I believe the Lord can do that, don't you? Don't you? So Heavenly Father, thank you, especially for the Holy Spirit, such a good teacher, here to help us as well and comfort us at times. Lord, do that and even more. And allow open our hearts, remove distractions, let our ears, especially spiritually, be open to the prophetic and to the written, in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, it's interesting as we take a look at this topic about our authority in Christ, it is always amazing to me how that we will today explain how Christ came into his authority and how we will come into our authority and how to operate in that authority. We're gonna take a look at it with regards to our prayer life, so you can imagine to put the kingdom first, and then you, it's gonna be important to take a look at that. It's very important. I'm believing we are in a spiritual setting. I'm talking to spiritual people. I get it. There are oftentimes there are people that are checking out church and thank the Lord for our live stream media. Many of you are here because you saw us on live stream first, you wanted to see what the interior of the chapel looked like, you wanna see what we're all about and you're here. But there are some that still figuring out their own spiritual pursuit, how much of God will they have in their life, 
And it's important because there are varying degrees of Christians. For example, there are a number of you who've been to Israel with Ainsley and I, and we're grateful. And their 20 or excuse me, 12 hour flight to Israel, you have to stretch and you walk around the cabin, you meet on the way to Israel, a lot of Jews. And it's interesting to talk to them. So I can say I literally have met a lot of Jews who are secular Jews, who are basically then liberal Jews or political Jews or traditionalist Jews or Orthodox Jews or ultra-Orthodox Jews, but they're all Jews. I've met Christians the same way. I've met some Christians that are very secular. I've met some Christians that are very liberal Christians. I've met political Christians. <laughs> I met all family conservative Christians. I've met those elements of fundamentalist or conservative Christians. I have met those very spiritual Christians that want to walk in the spirit. So there are a lot of Christians that are out there. Thank you, Jesus, for making heaven so easy. It's all through the cross of Christ and the resurrection. So you who believe, we're in. Man, we punched our ticket. We've got our passport. We're on our way to heaven. But there's something to do on earth. And sometimes we as Christians can play it down and say, I just, I'm just going to be a good old U.S. citizen. But God has more, and it's called the kingdom, and it's called our assignment, and he's given us authority to operate in that realm. So when we look here, it's important to see first how Jesus came into that authority. Because he's always our example, is he not? Jesus is always our example. It's like, man, if you say, well, I don't like church and I don't like Christians. Well, man, let's don't sit there too long. Let's follow Jesus. Can I get a witness? Amen. So point number one, Jesus has all authority in two worlds, physical world and spiritual world. That's our first point. We want to recognize that. I'm in Matthew chapter 28. The tragedy is with people, most people don't acknowledge the spiritual realm. They only know and they only operate the physical realm, but they kind of ignore that. That can be quite detrimental. It can be quite detrimental, especially when you're trying to go at adjusting and doing better in life and you realize, why do I never get ahead? Why is our family seems like we're all following the same pattern of this same time of just bondage that's being passed down from generation to generation. How come I can't kick it? And then we don't understand the spiritual realm. You can imagine as a pastor wanting to encourage Christians, let's get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Let's get that endowment with power. And when Christians don't want to consider the unseen world, then they don't, that trips them out. It's like, mm, and they start talking gifts of the Spirit, and like, what? I just want to go to church and sing from the songbook. That's the kind of comfort zone I like. So when we look here, it's going to be important that the Lord helps us and enables us. But let's look at Jesus for a moment. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus came, it says, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, check that word, all authority. That's important. That's not 90% authority. That is all authority. Verse 19, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, I love the four action verbs here. He literally says, go, and then he says, make, then he says, baptize, and then he says, teach. So that's what Hope Chapel is all about. People say, well, don't you have a nice little saying? Is there a phrase out there? Wow, well, we're all about missions and getting really the great commission. Jesus says, go you go. That means get out of our comfort level. 
probably a cross-cultural experience, probably a shocker talking to a stranger. But anyway, that's for another Mission Sunday. But with that, take a look here because power flows from authority. Jesus says, I've got all it. All authority in both heaven and on earth, both extremes, I've got it. Now, it's important because anybody in authority has the right to exercise power. It's like a police officer. He has authority to write tickets for those who are speeding, to arrest those who break the law. That person in authority should expect to have his vocal commands obeyed, to have what he's asking to be done, followed through. Basically, it's important for us. Someone in authority means you will obey their will. Jesus says, I've got all authority. Yes helpful who's in control of this planet jesus has all authority and it's important because scripture says in second corinthians 4 18 let's take a look at that for a moment because it talks about the two realms and we want to remember that when you're finding what is going on with my life but look at verse 18 it says so we don't look at the troubles we can see now that's important especially if you're seeing something you say man it's just Why do I keep seeing the troubles? And that seems to be what's happening with our society because the news always wants to have something in our grill to cause us to worry, dreadfully afraid. You get it. I don't need to say it. You just know when it's starting to come. But the scripture says, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen For the things we see now will soon be gone. Glory to God. It's going to be a new day tomorrow. But the things we cannot see will last forever. So everything you see right now, right now, will not be forever. Except Jesus and people. That's why the Lord commanded, love God and love your neighbor. But uh, I want to pause here for a moment because it's interesting. Holy Spirit... It's going to invite me to give a prophetic word, so I'm going to pass that on. It's kind of rare when I interrupt myself, but I'm going to blame it on the Lord. If you're watching us, the prophetic word doesn't mean it's a prophecy, but 1 Corinthians 14.3 says, if anybody speaks in a prophetic word, they speak edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. So may this be an encouraging word for you really kind of spends when we were talking and singing about the Lord being faithful, but especially about don't gaze at what you see. Look at what's unseen. But here I just want to submit this to you and to you. So, Father, thank you. I feel like the Lord would say, my child, you are always looking at what you don't have. My ability is not insignificant. There is no limit to my ability, nor am I somehow unable to reach your need. I know what you have been waiting for. I understand what you're wanting. Have not my words been spoken to you? For I say to you, once again, Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, from my word to you. For it shall not return to me void. It's going to go to the place I've directed it. It's going to prosper in the thing with which I send it and will not return void to me. Therefore, align your heart to have confidence in me. Be careful about trying to reason the why this is happening How is God going to help me? When will it come about? When you take a look at the situation you find yourself in, may the uncertainty and your concern cause you to run to my arms and find great comfort. I want you to know your maturity, your spiritual maturity is taking shape. As you wait for me, only do not despair. I know what I'm doing in the heavenlies, and it's good. Well, praise the Lord. We'll take that. 
Well, let me just pause. How many just needed to hear that just to say, well, thank you, Jesus. We're grateful. And so I trust that that was something for you as well. I like it when the Holy Spirit helps bring encouragement for us. You determine as a body of Christians, was that something of the Lord that was edifying, encouraging, comforting? And if it was like, well, okay, well, that's how the Holy Spirit works. Never judgmental, putting down. So the ways that God might do that. But then you determine, is it for me? If it's not, may we thank the Lord. It's for others in the room. But we take a look here. Jesus said on our message, all authority has been given to me. Who gave him that authority? The Father. Remember, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that triune God. God did. How did he come into that authority? Scripture says he humbled himself. So let's take a look at point number two. Because it says here, Jesus came into this authority by humbling himself and becoming obedient to the Father. Let's take a look now. Remember, Jesus is our example. God wants us to operate in that authority. How did Jesus come into this authority? So we look here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And though he was God, he did not think it Think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being when he appeared in human form. He humbled himself, even in obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So for a moment here, it's interesting to note, because we're seeing so clearly in our text, that Jesus took the humbled position. What was that? He became a human. Bible says it came a human, came a slave. He really humbled himself. That's amazing. That's the whole Christmas story. And we recognize that was necessary because we saw in the beginning of all time in Genesis 1, 26, that God said, let us make man in our image and let's give him dominion over everything. And it goes on and says, over the birds of the air and over the fish of the sea and over the cattle and over the, and I think that's an interesting phrase, and over the creeping things that creep on the earth. How creepy is that? I think the Lord brings that up because there's just a whole other realm of unseen out there called germ warfare. Huh? There's things that are alive, bacterias. I take authority over that thing. But they lost it when Adam and Eve decided not to humble themselves and follow God's directives about what is and what isn't fair game in the Garden of Eden. So it's important. Then it says here in our text that he humbled himself in obedience to God. He humbled himself, obeyed God even to the point of taking on a criminal's death for you and me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So he emptied himself. The word is kenosis. He had every privilege to say, man, I'm God and I can take care of this. But he humbled himself like a Christian should do. He spent time praying and said, Father, what's the direction today? When you see in the Gospels, he prayed before even picking the disciples. He's often up early in the morning. I need to be. So do you. Lord, What's the directive today? So he emptied himself. So that's all about our theme, the kingdom, then you. Most say, well, I think I know how to operate my life. That's important. We've got to be careful about that. So we see so clearly that the scripture says in Philippians 2, 10 and 11, every tongue's going to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Those creatures in heaven, those creatures on earth, and even under the earth. 
Some people that say there's a big holding tank of people that are only going to get out to see how much hell they'll get. I don't know if you've ever been to Carlsbad Caverns. There's some big caves there that could hold three to five football fields. There's a lot of cavities below the ground. Kind of interesting, huh? Well, we'll take another stand on that another day. But let's look at number three. Christians experience Christ's authority for their lives by humbling themselves and becoming obedient to Christ. Boy, please latch on to this right now. Take hold of this. See where you're at in your ability to humble yourself. Jesus Christ had absolute authority. And because he humbled himself, took on a form of a servant as a mere person, but then he obeyed the Father. Let's face it, you and I need the power of God's Spirit to operate in this physical world, to operate in this spiritual world. We need the Spirit. And it's important, like Jesus who came under the Father's authority, it's important that we do the same. Going back to Philippians 2.15, take a look at that once again. It says, you must, says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That's what the Bible says. King James says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. So it's going to be as long as we insist on being an authority, there'll be no power. It's important. I hope you caught that. Many times as a pastor over the years, dealing with and also sitting down with pastors and pastoral couples, it always seems to be the people that don't like the church cause the biggest trouble. They've never learned to come under authority. And a pastor is just a person. They're just a person, probably making poor choices, bad steps. But people usurp that and start to cause problems by ways they do things contrary or say there's times we sit down with a pat and it's always a suck time and energy but see they're not under the authority of jesus and it often comes by reason of being under the authority of that mere person that god puts in place it's a very real thing it's like first john says hey you say you love god but you can't love your brother who you see face to face how can that be so so it's important for us when I say, man, I want to move in the power because of the authority given to me. How do I come there? The same way Jesus did. I come under the authority or I humble myself. So there's two kinds of people, those who insist on their own authority. I'll do it what I want. I'll do it my way. And then they start talking down or somebody else's approach or way. Or the other person is those that say, I will submit to God's authority in areas of my money, in areas of my marriage, areas of my job, my family, even my future. God, I surrender. What do you want said or done? Man, that's going to be a great life for you this year. Great life. I like James chapter 4, verse 6. Check it out with me in 7. It says, and he gives grace generously. To who? To who? As the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's important. That's our job to humble ourselves. Now, I've also gone through the God self-imposed humbling. I call it humiliation. It's like, Lord, next time I'll just, I'll humble myself. Please don't make me humiliated. I do that so easily anyway. So we take a look at that, but look at verse 10. I think it's worth noting. James 4.10 goes on, says, Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. It's really the pattern Jesus took. It's really the pattern. Lord, what is it that you want? And God will do something to bestow his authority upon you and it's a game changer, literal game changer. Now, I want to show you in Acts chapter 19. I'm going to go there for a moment. I'm going to show you the difference of a person that's operating in that authority given by God and those that think they're just going to use the name of Jesus, but they have no authority. Check out what happened. It's worth noting. I'm in Acts 19, 11. 
It says, God gave Paul, the apostle, the power to perform unusual miracles. Who gave Paul the power? Can you see that there? God will give you power through authority to do unusual things. How do you get there? It's what we're talking about, humbling ourselves under the hand of God, I can, acknowledging our need to say, Lord, I don't want to do my own thing. My life is yours. I'm a born again son, daughter of God. What is it that you have? Back to our text, verse 11, God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles when handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Wow, that's pretty interesting. Let's go on with the text, verse 13. And a group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits, and they tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this, but one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but who are you? And then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. Holy Spirit edited it so that we can learn from that. It is worth noting, see these seven brothers, they had a, they had a reputation, did they not? Their daddy was a bigwig in the synagogue. So you have these seven sons of Sceva, but they were patterning themselves from what they heard, at least by Paul, we command you in the name of Jesus, but there's no authority. So when we're going to be taking a look at some things here, I want you to have that authority. You can be born again, but what if you're not in the right place in your submissiveness or humble approach before the Lord? So you can declare the name of Jesus, but you have no authority. And I think it's interesting and worth noting, the unseen world knows who does and who doesn't. Yes. Jesus, I know. Paul, I know but you've got no right to tell me what to do. Yeah. They're going to come across, you Christians, you're going to come across jurisdictions that you know we probably have no right to expel evil because it's not our domain yet, but you do where you live, do where you work, do where you rent. It's worth noting, let's look at number four, Christian's authority is given to minister life in the name of Jesus through the power of the Spirit. Let's look for a moment. I want to jump to Luke chapter 9, verse 1. Let's look at this. This is where we apply who we are, how we get there. One day, it says, Jesus called together his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority. What did he give them? Power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. That's pretty powerful. Jesus has a message. I'm telling you this message right now. It's only going to come by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And when you catch it, may you go and say, man, it's not like going to Hope Chapel. You, the kingdom is right now. And let's talk about it. What do you need I can pray for you now. It's important. Remember, James 4, 7 says that we submit or humble ourselves before God. So it's all about the kingdom of God, putting the kingdom first. I do like the fact in John 20, 21, we'll just emphasize that again. It says, Jesus said, peace be with you. This is after his resurrection. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Moving in the power because of the authority given to us by Jesus. It really, that power moves by the Holy Spirit. So important for us. As you go and as you live and come in contact with darkness, man, you will know. You'll know. The closer you are to that element of God and His holiness, you realize something's not right here. I think we've all gotten off of planes and realized in other nations saying, well, this just feels 
a little oppressive. Something's not right here. I want to go back to Orange County where everybody's perfect. <laughs> and the streets are swept by these machines. And they pick up trash on a regular basis. There's something that's going on there. So remember the kingdom is God's reign through God's people over God's place. Yes. Wherever you go, yes. you belong to him. Let's take a look. How does it operate? Two ways of prayer. The prayer of petition. It's usually what we're used to. It's asking the Father in the name of Jesus Christ for something. It's important for us because you remember we were even dealing with the armor of God if you're doing the 21 days of prayer and fasting. Remember in Ephesians 6, 17 and 18, put on the helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying all prayers in the Spirit, in supplication and in the Spirit. All prayers. But there's something that's powerful about even just praying. Look at what John 14 says, verse 12, says, Jesus said this, and I tell you the truth. I, I don't expect Jesus to lie to us, but I tell you the truth, anyone, everybody say anyone, anyone, who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. And you can ask for anything in my name, and I will do it, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Who's going to do it? Twice he says, I will do it. I will do it. That's why a Christian, by the way, prays in the name of Jesus. It's very important. You say, well, why do the Christians just, you know, in Jesus' name we come, Father, to ask this or pray a blessing over our food? or we end it in the name of Jesus. Very powerful. This is the reason. Ask anything in my name. And make sure you say Jesus. Don't say in your name. Say the name. Amen. Say the name. Jesus. You don't know if you're with a Muslim. Right. He'll be glad you didn't say the name. Say the name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. That sounds good, doesn't it? She's heartwarming. It's like, yeah, that dude, that woman, she's a Christian, isn't she? So it's important, even greater works. And Jesus says, I'm going to do it. And we've been encouraged to pray, to come to the throne of grace. Remember that? Write that down, Hebrews 4, verse 16. So let me just make a moment here before we hit our final point. This area of half an hour of prayer with God, it, their second point is wait on God. Just pause. We talk petition. I'm coming for my need. The pause is so significant. Why? Because you might want to add, like most Christians, they'll say, well, Lord, what is, what is it you want me to learn through this trial? How about just saying, what am I dealing with? What am I dealing with, Lord? I know I'm going through it. Who is my opposition here? Could be my own fatal mistake. But Lord, what am I dealing with? That's very important as a believer because you might find it's not about praying it through. It's more like you're dealing with an opposition, spiritual opposition. God could say something like Matthew 17, 22, hey, Paul, this kind doesn't come out except by prayer and fasting. Whoa, I thought I was just dealing with a rowdy bunch. So it's important you ask the Lord. That's why Jesus prayed. He submitted to the Father. He knew if there's any power that's going to come, it's going to be by the Holy Spirit. Remember when he was water baptized by John the Baptist? Spirit came down on him like a dove. Everybody saw it. You have that same approach, exact same approach. Lord, why am I not hot for you anymore? What am I dealing with? God can show you. Letter B, let's move on to that. Prayer of command. And that's what I call it because it's just a little different than just a petition or supplication or a request. Prayer of command, this is a prayer of authority. It's not a request. <clears throat> you are basically, it's the authority given to us from Christ and we move by the Holy Spirit. That's important when we take a look at that because it's not only to, 
when we have power encounter, casting out demons, or healing the sick. Those references are there. I want you to look at Luke chapter 10. Many times when you come before the Lord in prayer, my, my experience, it's like if this is just Lord, I know you just want us to ask our daily bread, you know those things, deliver us from temptation, and basically deliver us from the evil one. How many know it's in the Lord's prayer, there's something evil out there called evil spirits. And they're evil because that's their very nature. You will never get along with them. They're counter to Christ. If they're anti-Christ in spirit, they will never do you right. They'll twist it to take over and finally destroy you and everything of your happy home. Beware, and you'll know when they come. Now, it's interesting in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, check it out, because there's 72 disciples that discover something about the name of Jesus. And it says, when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of of the enemy. Ooh. I see that there, don't you? I believe the word. I don't pick and choose what I want to believe. I don't just settle what's comfortable. If I forget that there's an unseen realm and just go at the natural, you'll be a byproduct. I don't want that as a pastor. I want you to be out there and be mountain movers and influence people and then preach the kingdom. He goes on over all the power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. I've stood on that over some people, and nothing, verse 19 ends, shall by any means hurt you. Verse 20, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are written or registered in heaven. Praise God. Now, I get pretty excited about that. Especially when you go to the seven churches of the book of Revelation, you see, man, he's really pretty accurate about those who endure to the end. But let's check it out. This kind of prayer is just like a parent telling a child, listen, I want you to do this. This is a command. You don't say that. But if that child knows in any way there's a doubt in that person with authority or hesitation to follow through, that child's not going to do anything. That evil spirit who th knows that you might be a little knock-kneed and a little uncertain, they'll know it too. Jesus I know, Paul I know, maybe some members in your church I know, but who do you think you are? Be careful about that. Next Sunday, this message isn't an accident, our guest, Dr. Jerry Stott, when we were teaching, thank you, Ainsley, this book in February of last year, powerful. And we asked Jerry, if you ever break free from Australia, please come to Hope Chapel. Boom. He's going to be here. What a tremendous apostolic ministry he has. And if there's anybody that you need to read about and see moving in the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit, listen to this man. I think you'll be quite uh, encouraged how you, as a child of God, can move in those same things. Jerry, dealing with cultures in Papua New Guinea and in the Philippines and Southeast Asia, some collective groups of humanity in the spiritual realm of authority. Remember, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, spiritual wickedness, high places. Some of those realms have never heard the name of Jesus. And when the little preacher boy or woman comes and cracks the little Bible open, people start to manifest things. Here in Orange County, those little creepy oppressive spirits, they hear Jesus all the time. They can kind of come right on into church. Hey, if the devil could come into the upper room at the Last Supper, yeah, he could probably come into your home anytime maybe undetected, and not be quite troubled that you have a few plaques of scripture on the wall. 
because he knows the book too. But evil is out there. Let the Holy Spirit direct you on that. I want to cite a couple of examples and then let's be encouraged. Amen. How did Jesus come into this authority? And then he says, I give you that authority. Ooh. When we humble ourselves, Jesus, I'm your man. Heavenly Father, I'm your woman. I'm your child. What is it that you have? I do remember a couple of examples, and one in particular. When we had a chance Back in our first church, I won't tell you any of our current settings because you say, I think I know that person. <laughs> I was on a Saturday in the Christian Ed room, CE room, putting some supplies away and instantly I felt like my back had every hair not standing up. I was absolute fearful. And I knew something came into the room and the Holy Spirit said, command it to go and with my lips quivering because I wanted to run out of the room that's if you've ever dealt with fear people I can't drive the freeways anymore I don't want to go out of my house anymore I'm just afraid and I said in the name of Jesus fear get out and don't come again that was all I told it was a command and that lifted it's like, what just happened? Because I feel so at peace. Went back to work. Those things happen. And God shows us and helps us. Young man, when I had my first apartment at age 20, when I was a printer for Jesus, I took in a young man, he's 19. I'll just call him Taylor. I knew there was something wrong with him. He had a very busted up household, but very good artist, could draw three-dimensional, basically pastel renderings of creatures that just didn't, lizards and space creatures and craters. And But I remember one day, and I had him just for six months, I had some real opposition physically, had appendicitis, had my appendix removed, situations like, what's going on? One day, Taylor came home, Late at night, says, now where have you been, Taylor? And his faraway glassy eyeball said, I, I've got to leave and I'm leaving now because I knew something was up with my guests. And, he, and I said, Taylor, come on in. Le at least let me pray off a blessing. You got your little satchel here. And I sighted, I felt the Holy Spirit rise up in me. Ooh, ooh, it's so exciting when you just know there's a power struggle. Here I'm 21 years old, like, whoa. And I cite Luke 10, 19 and 20. He comes along. I said, remember, Taylor, Jesus said, behold, I give you power and authority. Tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Let me pray for you now. And I went to reach to just touch him. He squealed, went into literally a fetal position kicked himself over in my chair. His legs locked onto me. I was kicked over with him. And we're both in the corner and we're face to face. And I said, in the name of Jesus, come out of him. Now, just thought I would try that. And all of a sudden he went limp, pulled him up. Taylor, what happened? He said, as soon as you went for me, I saw chains go around me and it frightened me. He was radically set free. Problem was he couldn't draw anymore either. It was, his inspiration was from whatever. I could go on with other stories. Friends, you know if you work in a destination that's your jurisdiction and you're facing opposition, you can speak the name of Jesus and clear the airwaves. You go into a hotel room, you pay for that evening, pray it clean that's yours for at least that 48 hours now it's less I think if you have a home that you just acquired or an apartment clean it in the name of Jesus there's now times whenever we have something we've purchased we just bless nice furnishing Lord we thank you if there's anything maybe maybe that worker hit his thumb with a hammer 
and they said GD over this thing. And we just clean it in Jesus' name and bless it now. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but you never want to overlook the unseen world. It's very real. It'll affect the physical world more than you can imagine. God's so good, is he not? He's so good. If you are in contention with people, learn this, and this is my last story, and then we'll sing. We can go on with more ghost stories if you want, but that's all right. There's a man in our church in Banning. He was not doing well, causing a lot of problems, and I called him in the office. And as is my custom, if you've ever come to visit Pastor Paul, we pray first and we pray at the end. I just found through that one episode, take control over the airwaves. You speak and communicate over the air. And the Bible says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air. So what I want to tell you even now could be misaligned and like, what, what's going on? So I had this man come and I knew he was into really some wrong stuff. Matter of fact, we found out he was into sexual immorality with one of our volunteers. The Lord revealed all that, but I just said, Lord, you eliminate anything that's not of you in this room in Jesus' name. And I kept my eyes opened and literally a gray cloud just went up like that in front of me. I was like, what was that? And I knew something lifted and we had the best conversation. And for the time being, there was peace among us, but it was great. It's so good when you eliminate the spiritual counterproductive element. Well, I'm gonna leave you with that story. Take the name of Jesus, but before you do, you do what Jesus did, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will honor you in due time. He'll get all the glory. It's a good word. Let's stand to our feet, shall we? I wanna thank you for joining us today at Hope Chapel Huntington Beach. It's our desire to bring the teachings of this church to others globally. If today's message has brought you closer to Jesus, we want to know. Can you send us an email to office at hopechapelhb.org? Would you consider supporting this ministry financially? You can give securely online at hopechapelhb.org slash give. If a check is your preferred method, you can send a mailed check to Hope Chapel, P.O. Box 548, Huntington Beach, California, 92648. If you want to be contacted by Hope Chapel, would you consider subscribing to our weekly newsletters at hopechapelhb.org slash subscribe. Whatever season of life you're in, we want to go through it with you. We want to thank you once again for joining us, and God bless you.